to our Reckon Accounts software here. This is probably very familiar territory for everyone. Um, I first of all, I actually want to just look at um, the reports and graphs. We want to look at the preferences that sit behind the way Reckon is actually set up and used. So that's found in under the edit menu. And if we go down to preferences, and there's sort of the whole series of tabs down the left hand side here to, under various sections of the program. And in many cases, there's my preferences and company preferences. So company preferences are to do with global preferences. That whatever set in the company preferences screen is going to apply to everyone who uses the program. And then your my preferences where you can filter and customize the program to be more suited to how you want to work actually with it. Um, this, the first section I just wanted to have a look at was reports and graphs. Um, first of all, um, this tick box here is interesting. Prompt me to modify a report before opening a report. If you tick that box, then when you run a report, it will actually open up on the screen your preferences and, and modifications to enable you to modify the report before actually running it. It's quite handy for those, especially those that have got large data files and you want to actually do some customizing or filtering before you actually run the report. Then you go and run the report. You don't want the report to run first and then have to do all your modifications and then actually run it again. It, it sort of doubles up the time and effort there. I'm going to look in company preferences here. Uh, default reporting, accrual or cash, uh, tax net or gross. Now, this gets confusing for people. This is uh, the first hints and tips that we're going to go through, which is hints and tips number 248, which is the very first one in the workbook. If you're operating a business, we would highly recommend that you tick the rules there. This has nothing to do with your GST reporting. Um, so a lot of people, um, when they're setting up their system, they say, well, okay, my tax is done on a cash basis, which, or my GST on a, is on a cash basis, so therefore I want to tick cash here. I, after being an accountant for sort of 15 years, I'd say, no, that's not the, the correct answer. Make sure we've got accruals tick there. If your accountant does your tax return on a cash basis, then they can make all the necessary adjustments by looking at reports um, to actually get your tax back to a cash position. Uh, tax net or gross, normally you would have net selected there. If you tick gross, then your profit and loss figures are going to be including GST, and you tend not to want to have that because you don't want to be taxed on the tax of GST. So. Accrual and net should be selected there. Um, the other thing to have a look at in here is if we run through sort of this general preferences area, um, if I go into my preferences, this tick box here, pressing enter, moves you between fields. A lot of people either use tab or like to use the enter key to tab and move through the fields that when you're entering data. So you might be entering an invoice. Um, if you tick this box here, it says press enter move to move between fields. The enter key will tab you through the various fields within an invoice screen. If you leave that unticked, then you're probably going to use tab more often or the mouse to actually navigate um, through there. Um, if I go into, um, into reports and graphs as well, if I go back to the company preferences here, um, sorry, back into, where are we there? Our general preferences, um, our, oh, sorry, our accounting preferences. So under company preferences here, under accounting, um, there's a few things to look at here. Use account numbers. Often people don't have that ticked. If your accountant um, has account numbers set up for you, and they generally would if they're using um, tax preparation software of some sort, um, they would have uh, your chart of accounts set up with account numbers. You can tick that box on. So when I tick that box, use account numbers, um, if I tick that and then I say, okay, when I go into the chart of accounts, you'll now see that actually what we've got here is in some accounts, we've got this account number appearing. So I've got inventory asset here and 12100 shows up. If I edit that account and right mouse click, this box appears, the number box. And that's where you can actually type the number in there that is, relates to your accountant's chart of accounts or you just might, to like, might, might like to use numbers when you're actually entering your data instead of having to type the word inventory. You just know that there's a number sitting behind that. Um, if we go back to our edit preferences and we can go back into accounting and if we turn that off, then that box actually disappears. Um, if the other thing I wanted to take a look at in our preferences here is we want to actually look under our um, accounting preferences Class tracking can be turned on. Uh, it's just a tick box there. That just enables you for the ability to report across divisions of your business. So if you've got that box ticked, 
what it actually does under our list menu, we've got this list called class list that appears. And I want to track out the business here between our Melbourne business or our Sydney and the Sydney's broken down into two locations being northern and western suburbs. So when you enter a transaction, you can choose what is which uh, invoice or what, what uh, division of the business did that invoice relate to or that expense. And of course, then you can report at some later stage under our company and financial area, we can run a profit and loss by class. So if I looked at last financial year and said, okay, we can see here now, and I'll collapse that down, is we can see this is what Melbourne's done, this is what Sydney's done, and this is what has been unclassified. So maybe you want to go through and actually classify those transactions. Um, one thing I will do is while I'm at this stage of editing these preferences, I'll also go to the view menu and change the open and turn on open windows list. That actually brings up this side panel here and it actually enables us to see what is it that we're working on at the moment. And you can see I'm just toggling it around between the various um, tabs that I've got open and working on. You can have a myriad of them, it could be reports, it could be actually setups or preferences. Um, or inquiry of, of lists, for example. So it's not a bad idea having that view open windows. If you tick that on, um, that's actually where that comes from. Um, so back in our accounting preferences, if I go back to our edit preferences, and I was under accounting, the other thing that uh, is pretty useful actually is the ability to warn if um, transactions are entered ahead of time or they're a date that's actually a long time ago. As you know, Reckon Accounts actually is date driven. So everything that you enter into the Reckon Accounts system is, is really um, how, the, how it'll report will be dependent on the date that you give the transaction. So all of your business history can be kept in one place. You know, for us, we've been using the product for more than 20 years. So we've got 20 years worth of history in our data file. But you do want to make sure that people aren't misdating something. So this date warnings box, warn if transactions are 30 days in the past. I would tend to say, um, yeah, that's probably about right. If, if you're actually getting up to date with your book work and maybe some suppliers take a while to send you an invoice, then don't warn me if it's within the last 30 days. Um, perhaps though, the warning if transactions are in the future Maybe warn me if I'm entering a transaction date of one date or one day in the future. Um, you don't want to accidentally put it, being putting transactions in a future period just because you've typed the date in incorrectly. Uh, when. So get the system to warn you if a transaction date is more than one day beyond today's date. Um, the other thing while we're in here uh, is setting a closing date. And we've got this box here that says set closing date. Now we can see here that this file has been set up with a date closed through to the 30th of the 9th, 2020. If your data file, when you're in this preference here, if you see no date there, it just means that you've never actually closed your books off. You've never set a closing date. Now the purpose of setting a closing date is to actually stop you or someone else making an accidental or deliberate change to a transaction on or before that closing date. So if you've finished a BAS period or you've finished a um, end of financial year or even a month for that matter and you've finalised your bank rec um, and you've entered all the transactions for that month, I'd strongly recommend setting an actual closing date. So if I actually look at today's date of the 26th of October, you may want to go back and say, well, look, I've finished off June's, 30 June's BAS, um, so let's set a closing date there. As an admin user, you could set a closing date password. Um, and so if you've got the preferences set up to be able to change a, a transaction before the closing date, then you can simply type in a closing date password to actually enable that. And most other people, you know, if you, you can lock them down, the other way to, the way to actually lock them, anyone out of um, entering a transaction before the closing date. If you're using um, the premier edition of, of Reckon Accounts or the, um, the pro edition, then you can actually go and edit the actual user and within there there's a, a button that says don't enable someone to enter a transaction before a closing date. If you're using the enterprise edition or hosted um, then that's found up in the uh, com companies menu um, under, under users, uh, set up users and roles and I'll just log in. You'll need to be the admin user to actually jump in here. And if I looked at, um, let's say, uh, we've got this role list here, 
and I'll just edit that role. We've got in under the accounting area there, um, edit closed transactions. You don't want people editing the closed transactions unless you do give them the right to actually do that. So in this case, that person does have full rights, um, but if you can lock them out of there as well, based on their role on the role list that you assigned to the individual. Um, if we go back to our preferences, we'll just keep on going through a few, a few more of these areas as well. Um, back in the um, general preferences, uh, what you can do in here is um, automatically recall the information that you've last entered. So this, this is a little bit of a time saver um, in this, this tick box here. Automatically recall information. So when you're entering a, let's say, a supplier bill, and it's the Telstra bill, so the system can do one of two things. Well, one of three, really. You could untick that, and it won't recall any previous information that you've entered or the most recent inf information you've entered for the supplier being Telstra. If you do tick that, then what it will do is it'll automatically recall the last transaction for the supplier name that you actually, actually are entering. And so it'll bring up the amount and the allocation as to where you've, you've entered that transaction to. You may not want that. You may simply just want to pre-fill the account, so let's say telephone expenses, as the supplier details. So when you tick that, the next time you enter a transaction with the Telstra bill, um, it won't automatically pre-fill based on the previous transaction because it's the first transaction after you've ticked this radio button here. The next time you enter a Telstra bill, it will recall the actual general ledger account that you've used for that Telstra um, bill that you previously had entered after you ticked on this tick box. Um, we'll say OK to that. So that's actually um, setting up in the, um, in, the, in the preferences there. So the other thing to um, just look at, and, and we often get a question around that, is that in the supplier centre, We've got this supplier um, called Australian Taxation Office, and that doesn't, it, it, it basically never shows up in your accounts payable listing. So your age, if I looked at a report here, you can see we've got a balance of 12,359. If I ran a supplier report, aging summary report, and if I just said, uh, let's say today's date, and said okay, we can't see the Australian Taxation Office on this accounts payable list, and nor should we. We don't actually have a, a bill outstanding for them. But there, there is a balance sitting in here. Now, you can, effect, you can effectively ignore that balance. Um, it just is a nuance of the system. Reckon really wanted us to actually enter all of your payments to the ATO through a managed tax screen, this box up here on the, in the home page. And and pay your liabilities through there. But what we've found over the years is that's not the most effective way to enter your BAS payments or your pay-as-you-go withholding or even your income tax payments. So a little bit of a hangover there is that it keeps this balance. The balance itself, you can ignore that um, and as long as it's not showing up any balance in the accounts payable aging summary report. Um, uh, the next thing I want to have a look at, and we're sort of moving on, you, the workbook itself, I'm going to refer to the hints and tips numbers as I'm actually going through this uh, session. You don't have to furiously try and find the page in the workbook. It's really for your own guide to be able to refer back to. So I'll mention the hints and tips number that relates to the hints and tips that I'm actually showing you. So if we want to look at the actual entering of data, date shortcuts, there's a lot of shortcuts that you can actually do when entering, entering data. So let's say I'm just opening up a, a bill here, a supplier bill, and I'm just going to type um, T for Telstra, Telstra here, um, the date. Now, by default, the system will actually bring up today's date. Now, there's a whole series, this is hints and tips number 14. I could type the letter M, and M is the first letter in the word month. So it actually, by default, takes us to the first day of the month in which we're currently in. The word month finishes with the letter H. So I could type the letter H, and it takes us to the last day of the month that we're currently in. If I wanted it to be the start of the week, W, just key the W key, or hit the W key on your keyboard. The word week finishes in the letter K, so type K for the end of the week. Today, 
the letter T. So you can just type the letter T for today and it'll bring up today's date. Uh, the year, the year is actually calendar year. So if you type the letter Y, it'll take us to the 1st of January for the year that we're actually in. If you type the letter R, it'll take us to the last date of the year that we're actually currently in, in a calendar year. Um, so the other thing is, if I type the letter T for today, you can also be using the plus or minus key. So I'm just using the minus key there. If I change that to the plus key, it just increments by a day or two. So there's absolutely no need in Reckon to th enter th things like 26.10.2021 or anything like that. Um, it'll get you the same result. Uh, there's no need to enter the slashes 1021. Again, it'll get you the same result, but it's just time consuming. If it's today's date, the letter T for today, if you want to go back a day, hit the minus key. And of course, you can choose the, the uh, date shortcut um, screen here. So you can obviously grab the mouse and actually go and grab the date that you actually want to enter. <laughs> Um, the, the, another thing is, uh, and often you're uh, when you're typing in amounts, and if you think of something like the petty cash um, reimbursement, and you and you've got a heap of receipts sitting beside you, and you're trying to add them up. Now you can add them up within Reckon. So when any number field, you can start typing. So if I type 25 and then the plus key. It'll bring up like a little uh, cash register strip here. Um, if I had $24.50, uh, then the plus key, 34, plus 7, plus 65, and hit the tab key or enter, it'll just simply tally up the total. So any number field, um, and you know, for example, we might say, well, okay, we've got printing and stationery, of a, including GST, of $155.50, because that's the total of the actual um, payment that I'm entering here. But only a portion of that. I want to take off um, $65 because I know that actually is a part of fuel. So you can you, you can type pluses and minuses. You can multiply. So if I, if I had $65 and I wanted to multiply that by uh, 5, and then so it'll actually do that calculation on the fly there. So it saves, saves a little bit of time. Of course, you can go to the calculator, which is under the edit menu, and we can use calculator as well. So you can actually put that on the screen and start doing your calculations if it's a little bit more involved as well while you're entering your data. Another thing I want to have a look at, and by the way, that hints and tips is number 186, is memorize transactions. So to save time in actually entering your data, the things that recur on a regular basis, what we can do is set them up as memorised transactions. So for example, I've got the Telstra bill here, not a great example, putting it to printing and stationery. I'm just going to take those lines out and all I'm doing is hitting the control key and the delete key. It just takes out the line. Uh, you could hit the control key and the letter D. If I went up to edit here, control D actually can remove the actual bill. Um, I don't want to do that at this stage. So I'm going to put the Telstra bill in here. I'm going to put it to telephone. Um, I'm going to put in the 155.50. Oops, not in there, I'm not. Um, 155.50. And I'm going to make sure I've got the GST correct, correctly entered. Oops, 155.50. I've got the amounts include tax tick box selected down the bottom left hand corner there. Um, just while I'm on it, down the bottom left hand corner you might see supplier tax code there. Um, what you can do is you can go and assign the tax code of NCG to the supplier so it always shows up. Um, or you could actually assign a tax code in the chart of accounts. So if I looked at um, telephone here, I'm actually, the reason no tax code's showing up is because I'm putting it to a heading account. So if I went back to enter bills, so that's a bit of a sign, I should have actually assigned it to the, let's say the mobile, um, and then the NCG code will actually flow through. Now, you might be getting this uh, bill on a regular basis, so every month, for example. So instead of actually trying to enter it just from scratch each and every month, what you can do, and any transaction you can do this with, is you can right mouse click it just before saving it here and we can memorize this bill so when i click memorize and we just label it mobile yeah. account 
Yeah. And just remind me every <laughs> month. <laughs> and the next date to remind me <laughs> is the current date. I'll just put that back to today's <laughs> date. I'll uh, see the reference in there. I made a couple of changes just then. I can re memorize that so we could actually memorize. Um, sorry. It'll try and create it again. If I was going to memorize transaction, I can re memorize it at the moment. So I can save and close that transaction. Now, next time the Telstra bill arrives, you can then go into um, the reports, or oh, sorry, this memorize transactions, control T. And this is at, uh, hints and tips number 348 in the workbook. So if we click on memorize transaction list here, and you can see I've got a stack of transactions pre-memorized in here. There's one right down the bottom here called Telstra mobile account. I'll actually just sort this by um, perhaps date. And I've now got Telstra at the top of the screen here. So when you actually receive the Telstra bill next time, you can simply come into your list memorized transaction list and double mouse click on the Telstra mobile account name here. It's giving us a warning saying, hey, this is more than one day in the future. That's because I've got the next date being November. I'll say OK to that. So it pre-fills the information that we previously memorized. So at that point, you would just be keying in the tax invoice number, um, the actual amount, because that's highly likely it changed, or though it might be a recurring uh, bill for the same amount each month. And then you can get on with saving and closing that transaction. Yeah. And it'll increment the date then to the next month in readiness for you to actually enter the next month's um, Telstra bill. A lot of people, have, particularly in the last four or, four or five years perhaps, have been looking to connect their bank data with, with the Reckon Accounts data file. And that, look, you can do that. Um, but in a lot of cases, you've already entered your transactions. You've managed your bills. You've managed your uh, customers. You've managed your payroll. And then outside of that, it's the recurring transactions that happen on a regular basis. So if you set a lot of them up as memorized transactions on a recurring basis on some sort of frequency, then you can simply double mouse click on these and just enter them very, very quickly into the system. Um, another question we often get asked is transferring amounts between bank accounts or any or any balance sheet accounts for that matter. This is hints and tips number, number 91. Under the banking menu or within the chart of accounts, let's say we wanted to transfer money between the bank check account here and an online clearing account. So we need to clear out the clearing account. So I'm just simply right mouse clicking on the check account and clicking on transfer funds. It's also found under the banking menu, transfer funds as well. So from here, this is going to handle both accounts at the same time. It's going to handle a transaction coming out of a bank account and into another account. So you don't need to then go and enter another transaction in that second bank account. Uh, if we just do that as today, let's say, okay, put that to the clearing account. Yeah, normally a clearing account should clear out. Um, and we'll just hit save and close there. So that's handled the transfer from one account to the other in, um, in one simple step. Um, another question that we get asked um, from time to time is, well, how do I easily find the customer um, invoice that, that the payment relates to? And this is answer sheet number 238. So if I look in the area here in, in when we're receiving payments, and so what you can do, and I'll actually cheat a little bit here, I'll go into our customer center. I can see that there's a tax invoice number um, and the invoice number is 2665. So I'm gonna right mouse click and I'm gonna receive a payment. Now, what you could do is you can go to um, and search. In fact, I'll do it this way. If I'm in the, receive payment screen, I've, all I can see in my bank account is a payment reference number. I don't know who it was that paid us. I can go and search for a tax invoice number by clicking on find customer slash invoice and we'll just search for 2665. And it then goes and finds that tax invoice and it was Amstrad Builders. And then I can use that transaction. It'll automatically tick it, the amount supplied, and you just got to check that that's actually what got deposited in your bank statement. So we'll see what that goes there. Um, another question we often get asked to is also around terms, end of month terms. So 
some uh, businesses or some industries still have 30 days end of month for whatever reason. They, they just want to make sure that every invoice that gets generated in this month is not overdue until the end of the next month. So the way to actually do this is if we go to our um, terms list here, and if we go into customers, and we'll just, sorry, customers and suppliers into terms list, by default, Reckon doesn't have this end of month item actually set up. What you can do is go to new, and we can go 30 days end of month, and just say that it's date driven, and it's due in the next month if it's 31 days at the end of the, it's due before the 31st day of the month, and due in the next month if issued within 31 days of the due date. I know it sounds a bit strange to set it up like that, but if I say 30 days end of month, and then I go into an invoice, and if I looked at those terms there and I said 30 days um, end of month, and oops, we need to find an actual um, a document with a due date. So on the right hand side here, we select 30 days end of month, Oh, that's a July invoice, so that's due at the end of the following month, at the end of August. Mm. So that's just a simple way to actually set that item up. Not bad, okay. You might see, uh, depending on how you've actually configured your system, you may not have these icon bars at the top of the screen here. So I've got, you know, the home page, the company snapshot, the centres. If you don't see those, that's just the um, navigation bar and also the icon bar. So if I change that and untick those two, in fact, if I untick the open windows, you, you actually get back to a pretty flat list of just the, the home page there. So I'm going to turn those back on. So turn on the navigation bar and I'm going to turn on the icon bar. Now, the navigation obviously takes you to the various centres, the customers, suppliers, employees and reports, online banking. Um, the actual um, icon bar here, you can build out yourself. So any transaction or any report, and this is hints and tips number 27 when in the workbook, can be actually, for your own purposes, can be tagged to the actual icon bar. So let's say you're doing things quite regularly. You might be in charge of entering credit adjustments for the business, so refunds and adjustments. So when you bring up that screen, you can right mouse click, um, or actually, sorry, when you bring up the screen, you can then go to the edit menu. What am I talking about? The view menu. And in the view menu, you can say, okay, add, create adjustments and refunds to the actual icon bar. And we'll call it adjustment node, say okay. So now, that is, this is unique to you as a user. So as, as a shortcut, you might just want to have the half a dozen types of entries that you do for the business up here in the icon bar, instead of having to find them actually on the, in, the, um, in, in the icons within the home page. So when I click on adjustment node, it'll just take me to that adjustment node entry screen. Likewise, you could do the same thing um, with reports. So this is uh, answer sheet number 222. So when I have a report on the screen, and you might be in charge of actually following up overdue accounts. So obviously customers and receivables, um, there's just uh, open invoices there, or uh, maybe a um, customer balance uh, detail report, show me everything that's actually outstanding. Take a moment to generate that. Um, you might want to then memorize that report or actually just go to the view menu and add that customer balance detail report to the actual icon bar. So now that creates a shortcut for you to actually be able to access um, that detail contained in, in that report. If you've got multiple company files that you're working in, well, I see a lot of people, and just here's a little tip. When you're changing company files, don't hit the cross in the top right hand corner. Um, particularly if you're in a network environment. It can often leave a session open, um, it can cause issues and, and host it, particularly if you're trying to then get back into the file, it might say you're already logged back in. Please, when you're exiting a, a Reckon data file, always go to the file menu and exit. Alt F4 is the shortcut. Um, but if you've got multiple company files that you're in and out of during the day, you don't have to go out of the program or close this company down and then go and try and find the data file. What you can do is in this open previous company area, and we can see this is the company file that I'm currently working in, 
we can set a number of previous companies that you get to see in a list here. So if you've got half a dozen company files, um, set this pre open previous company to, to six. And so then when you actually go, and I'm, I know I haven't been into six files yet, but if you then go and open up those individual files, you will see then them listed down the, in, in a list here of all the previously opened companies, the most six recent unique companies. So it's a quick way to just toggle then and just grab the company name on the list instead of going to close company, logging out or exiting or anything like that. Um, it, once you've got multiple um, screens open here or mul multiple um, you know, transactions or reports, um, control tab actually toggles between them all as a shortcut. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so that, you know, for some people that's an easier way of getting around than actually using the mouse. We've got a heap of things open. What if we don't want all of those open at the moment? You can actually go and close all of them down in actually one hit. So we can go to the window, uh, close all. Um, that will then, when I click on that, it'll just automatically go and close all of those windows that you've, you've, got, you've had open. It'll close the home page as well, and you can just click on home to make that um, reappear. Oh. Another thing that you see is people um, wanting to perhaps open up a data file um, with the reports that they previously had open, or you could be stuck in a loop where the, every time you open your Reckon data file, it's trying to open all of the reports that you previously had open, which can take ages to actually log into that file. So this is answer sheet number 100, 109. If we go up to edit preferences, and we've got the, um, where, uh, where are we there? The desktop view. So within here, and this is a preference that you can set for yourself. You can choose to actually um, save this company or save, save the, the reports or save the desktop um, when closing my company file. So if you tick that, if everything that you've got open, and it could be entering in invoices, it could be running reports, that will reopen when you go into the data file next time. So it can take a while to then run that report before you actually get to start operating in the file. It can be annoying. So I wouldn't suggest having that ticked. You might have a couple of things that you always want to have open, like say the enter invoice screen or the or receive payment screen, and you've got them open at the moment. You can, you can anchor in stone your current desktop setup. So if you tick save current desktop, um, then it will sort of take a snapshot as to what you've currently got open when you select that radio button. For most people though, it's just don't save the desktop. You know, if you, if you set up your icon bar properly with the things that you regularly go into, um, don't go and save a heap of reports every time you close down the data file, unless there's one particular report that opens quite quickly um, that you want to anchor on every time you open the file. If you want the home page to open automatically instead of having to go and click on the home page icon, you can tick that box to say show the home page when I'm actually opening um, my data file. The next thing I want to have a look at is actually your, your data inquiry, actually looking at the way you're, you do enter um, information but also um, reporting on that, in, that information as well. I'm going to spend a moment looking at customising reports. And Reckon actually has a really powerful reporting engine. You probably then we need the pals. Number one thing with reports, you cannot muck anything up by looking at a report. So I suppose what I'd say there is just be curious. You know, be inquisitive about actually um, wanting to see well what what does this report show me? And there is just so many customising and filtering options in Reckon Accounts. It's probably the most powerful reporting engine of small business accounting software really available in all the different products that are available on the market today. And it's been that way for a long, long time. So if we're going to customise reports, um, let's look at changing the header, the footer, the date, the time, and, and look at some of the things that are possible. But I would say just, just be curious. You know, spend some time getting in here and actually playing around. With, with the report settings. So this is answer sheet number 39 and number 218, specifically looking at um, sort of changing that header and format. So if I, I just run a report and I might want to run a profit and loss 
pretty standard report for last financial year or even this financial year. And what we'll do is we'll modify, we'll actually go to last, last financial year. Um, I might want to collapse that down so I don't need to see the sub accounts. I really just want a, a summarized view of my profit and loss. You may also want to modify this report. Just let's show me last year, show me the previous year, show me, show me how much the figures have changed in, in dollar terms, and show me that percentage change as well, the, the, the difference expressed as a percentage. And you can see here we're down 31% over the year in this business. Um, you might also, by default, say, well, okay, I don't want the word profit and loss there. I want to modify that report. So we're just going to go into the header here. And this is the report title. All of this is customizable. Um, this year and last year. <laughs> and some change and change. Any wording you like here. Huh? Say okay to that. So that'll actually change that heading. The other thing that we can do um, is in, within the modified report, there's sort of these four tabs across the screen here. The first tab gives you all different options as to have, how you want to show or represent the data. Um, if I un untick that, I may want to just show this as a percentage of overall income. So show me um, my gross profit margin expressed as a percentage. My net profit expressed as a percentage of my overall total income. Um, wages expressed as a percentage of income. You know, there could be just uh, key <laughs> metrics that you actually want to look at there. <laughs> Within the modifying of the report again, um, we can do filtering. So you may not want to see the entire uh, profit loss. At the moment, all income and expense accounts are actually displaying. So in filtering, and filtering sort of got all these multiple various filters down the left-hand side here, I'm just filtering on the account that's being displayed. So I get the option to say, well, okay, just let's have a look at all ordinary income and cost of goods sold. So my gross, my trading revenue. So here's the sales, less the cost of sales. And our gross profit and our gross profit percentage. You might want to memorize that report. Um, you may also want to display it um, visually a little bit different to the, the default layout that's actually here as far as fonts and colours are concerned. You might want to show or not show the date and time this is actually prepared. So I could say okay to that. You may also want to change, mix up the numbers. So anything that's in negative, um, show it in brackets. Show it in bright red. No, no, no. Um, you may have large numbers, so you'd want to divide, divide the total by a thousand. You might want to remove the cents. Um, just actually uh, don't show numbers without cents, or show numbers without cents. Wasn't a great example for the for the red though. If I go actually modify that report, we might be able to um, go back to the filtering and we'll bring that back to how it was with all ordinary income and expense accounts. Say okay. And if we set all, all income and expense accounts, we can see if we compare um, last financial year, we'll modify that report, we'll show the previous year and the dollar change, we might start to see some negative figures showing up as in red. When you're in a report like this, you can also just simply right mouse click um, somewhere on the screen and modify the font sizes. So you might want to bring uh, some colour into here. You might want to say that's that's purple, and we'll just say yes to that. And it's, suddenly, it changes all of them to purple. You don't have to do every single um, report, every single function of the report there. You might just want to do it for particular um, rows. I'm going to change that back. I might change that to um, yellow. This is going to be weird. Um, and there's the columns of yellow. You can hardly see them. But you can mix and match however it is that you want to actually do that. Once you've done that, you could then actually uh, memorise um, that report as well. So from there, in fact, I'll, I'll show you a, um, another report. If I looked at, um, just go back to profit and loss standard, and we'll say last financial year. 
You might want to also look at your profit and loss for all dates, forever. So instead of just last financial year, we've got a whole series of, you know, you like a custom date in here, select your own date range, but scroll up and you can see the word all, or just type the letter A for all. And now it'll show all the figures forever in this particular data file. We might want to collapse that down. We might want to then show that by year. So show me every year in this data file. So we started off in 2004. This is just a sample file. So there's about four years, five years with no data in there. Um, and then we picked it up again back in 2020. So from that point, we can then memorize the report. So any report, um, we might want to, I'll change the heading on that one again. <coughs> Profit and loss, um, all dates by year. Say okay, and then we could memorize that report. So when I memorize a report, the, the purpose of memorizing it is that, so that you can easily access it again. You don't have to go through all the customizing and filtering again. So if I say okay to that, it'll actually now appear in a memorized report list. And this is answer sheet number 38. And so when I go to reports, down to um, memorized reports, you can see that the actual report shows up in this list here. It's a profit and loss all dates by year. Or it also, and it also, yeah, it shows up in the memorized report list, not only in the menu there. So you might have, and we'd recommend, is having suites of reports. So you can see this report just sitting on its own at the top of the screen here. But we've got a whole series of reports that actually have got headings related to them. So if I go and actually create a group of report, I might say new group, um, year on year reports as a heading. And now I can drag and drop, just left mouse click and move that report. And I've just positioned it in underneath the actual uh, year on year reports. Your best reports might be a whole, whole suite of reports. If you wanted to then run a group of those reports at once, so this is um, answer sheet number 207 and 407, we can simply double mouse click on that group heading. Uh, you could change the various dates there for you know, and periods to um, the last financial year or memorize them as that. Might, might just get into month reports here, it'll be easier to see. Um, change the date ranges. You could then hit display and it'll display all of those reports in one hit. I won't do that. That'll take a little while to generate all those. If I looked at customers here and I said I wanted to look at um, all the open invoices and the balance summary, if I hit display there, it'll go away and generate each and every one of those reports. There's three of them and just display them in the open windows. Um, you could just go and print them directly um, in one hit there as well. Often when we've got information in a report, we may then want to send that data to Excel to do a bit more um, work on actually presenting that report in a different way. There's a lot of customizing, as I said, in Reckon, but sometimes Excel's your friend when you really want to present reports um, specifically to how you want to format them. So at this point, any report can be um, then exported. So when I click the export button at the top of the screen here, we could say send that to a new Excel workbook. And obviously if you're using Reckon Hosted, you can save that document and then download it and open it up using Excel um, on your workstation or your laptop or where, whatever you device you're actually using and ha that has Excel on it, um, if or, or, or Google Docs for that matter. So. The tip that I just want to give you here is a lot of times when people open up an Excel report from Reckon, the heading doesn't appear on the screen. So the business name doesn't appear. Just tick this box that says send header to screen in Excel. I'm just going to click export there. It'll go away and open up Excel. And then we can see that there's the report with the heading actually showing up in the report. The other thing that sometimes uh, you may want to do, if I click on export and I go to advanced, um, untick space between columns because by default it may just select spaces to show up between the various columns. Or you want, might want to show spaces um, actually in there. Um, the other area I wanted to take a look at was under the centres and this whole notion and, and items and payroll lists and so any list 
we can customise to change the view. Um, we can see more information in columns beyond what we just see as a default. So I'm in the customer centre here. Now, I've turned on, I've enabled the terms to be shown. So if I right mouse click, the way to do this is right mouse click and right mouse click opens up a whole new world in lots of cases. Um, go down to um, customise columns and from in there you've got a choice as to all of these columns can be displayed. There's a whole stack of them. You might want to see the actual email address for the, company, uh, for the customer. You might want to see their phone number. Um, you might want to actually show, um, you know, phone and email. We'll, we'll go there. And then you can just change the columns by grabbing the left mouse button and dragging and dropping once the, once the mouse changes from a pointer to a sort of a cross there. And we can start to see that information. You might want to sort it by the amount that they owe, by alphabetically by the name, by email address. And so therefore, anyone that doesn't have an email address will be at the top or the bottom of the list here. So you can choose and go and edit those particular customers and enter an email address for them. Likewise, customising columns can also be done in any other list. So if I look at a item list and I want to see um, out of all of my items, where to, what sales account, what uh, cost of goods sold account is, is allocated to that particular item, I can right mouse click and again, customise columns. So by default, there's very few columns that display in here. Um, but you can then choose, well, okay, I want to show the asset account or the cost of goods sold account for those of you using stock and inventory. Um, it will now show you, well, which account actually is being used when this transaction is used, what account does the um, inventory get updated and what account is the cost of goods sold that gets updated. So you can look for things that are inconsistent um, in these lists. Likewise, in payroll, as another example, you might want to see, well, okay, when I use a payroll item, what general ledger account gets updated when I actually enter that transaction or that use that item? So customise columns, show me the expense account and the liability account. And you're looking for inconsistencies here. So if salaries and wages is your normal salaries and wages account, you don't want to see something like payroll expenses in there. Superannuation is superannuation expense in this, in this file. Uh, we've got superannuation payable being our liability account. So this is a quick way to actually determine if things are pointing to the right location in your profit and loss, in your balance sheet, when an item is actually being used. So that's answer sheet number 426 um, and, and 229 as well. A few more things to wrap up on, on today's session is I want to look at um, this, this notion of using advanced find. So Reckon has inbuilt um, some find features, so to find data within in the system. So if I go to um, the uh, edit menu there and I go down to find, or control F, so all these little shortcuts here, any shortcut available on the screen that you're in, um, you can see the shortcuts listed in this column here. So control F um, can bring up the find menu. And there's two types of find. There's a simple find um, and there's an advanced find. So I actually want to look for something. I want to see, uh, we, we've got a policy in the business here. When we enter a credit adjustment, and if I go to refunds and adjustments, um, down in the memo field in the bottom of the screen there, in, in the memo, um, if something's being returned, we tend to put a word in there, let's say damaged goods. But I, So I want to see throughout the entire system, and I want to go to my um, view, oops, Edit find. I want to look for a description that says damaged goods. And when I search a find, enter the, um, click on find, the system found one match. If I double mouse click on this, and this is a transaction here from 2008, we can see the word damaged goods showing up in the bottom of the screen here. Now that, that description could also be in the body of the invoice. Um, you know, you think of people that um, want to search by car registration or some sort of description or I know I, t I, know I use that particular um, wording on a document, Reckon will enable you to search all of the documents and transactions in the system. Whilst we're looking up and inquiring on what has gone on with a transaction, 
Um, another thing I wanted to just touch on was the, um, the area of employees and how can you tell if an employee uh, payslip has actually been emailed? Now, in Rec and Hosted, you can go through the log and actually the email log and, and obviously see that. But in the transaction itself, so I'm just looking at Barry here as an employee and I'm looking at that last paycheck that we sent him. There's this box here that says sent via email and the date and to what email address it was actually sent to. For customers, and this is answer sheet number 132, um, in the customer area, if I go back to our customers here, and if a transaction is actually paid, I'll go into an invoice. So we've got a, a transaction here that's actually been, um, well, paid. I'll find, I'll find a paid transaction. We can actually then, tend, um, by looking up a, uh, Control H, so I've got this payment here. And if I go to an invoice here, let's say this invoice actually has a paid stamp on it. If I hit control, control key and the letter H, uh, what it does is it says, well, okay, if the email's been sent, and this just says sent date as pending, so that's telling me that that document has not been emailed. Um, but the send method is actually emailed. They're, they're, it is ticked to be emailed in the bottom left-hand corner. So if it was sent, then it actually saved the date that actually it was sent. So the control key and the letter H. Um, the other thing that control H does for you when you're in an um, a, a invoice here, it shows you what payment was applied to this invoice. We can see that this invoice has no balance down in the bottom right-hand corner. If I hold the control key down and the letter H, it brings up the history relating to this invoice. And from there, I can go and double mouse click and go and see the payment that was applied to this actual um, invoice. Uh, just a quick tip also when you're opening your data files, tip, tip number 489. If you want to um, open a data file without opening any reports, so let's say you have a stack of reports like we touched on earlier. Um, but they're just, running, they're just opening up. You can hold down the Alt key and it will uh, skip that process of running those reports. I'll just finish off on a couple of tips here that um, a lot of people aren't aware of but are pretty useful ones and they use them a lot and I know we use them a lot when we actually discovered them. In order, if you've got a large customer list, sometimes um, it can be annoying trying to actually get to a particular customer by just starting to type in their letters. So if I type the letter um, CL there, obviously it's gone to Clayton Promotions. But if you've got a large customer list, you might type two or three characters and then the system sort of resets itself to start searching with the next letter, not the first three letters of the name that you're looking for. How do you get around this? And, and I'm talk, more talking to people that have got thousands of customers in the list and you want to get to that particular customer. One way to get around this is actually, let's, in any um, transaction here, so if I go into an invoice, I'm not going to actually enter an invoice, but if I started um, typing C-L-A-Y, it will go directly to that customer name. So you can still um, keep typing in here. It's not gonna reset on you. Now that's useful to a point, but what if you wanted to go and look up the email address or look up the phone number or, or something else re relating to that customer? All you need to do is hit the control key and the letter L to go to the list. So control L takes you straight to that customer. Obviously from within there, you can um, edit information about the customer. You can see information about that customer. We've just used the invoice screen. You could use a sales order screen um, or a quote screen as the conduit to get to that particular customer. Now, interestingly, you can do the same thing for items. So you might have a really long item list, and I've typed, uh, I want to go to this item here, Windows Aluminium. Now, from there, you could also go directly to that item. So Control L, we could go straight to that item and start looking at that item and seeing you know, how many are on sales order, um, what's the cost, what's the sell price. Also, you might say, well, okay, that isn't the item that I want to use for this transaction. I'm going to choose this one further down and hit the control key and the letter U to use. And now it will bring in that item that you actually were just clicked on. So control L to go to the list, control U 
to use the item that you're actually on there. It's just tipped over to the hour. I'm going to leave it there. We've got um, plenty more to get through to uh, tomorrow. And uh, what I'll do is I'll pass you ha back to Andrew here. I'll close all these windows down, close all. And we'll reset the screen in readiness for tomorrow's session.